points that are ahead. I just wanted to start tonight's session by looking at Second Peter chapter three, uh, verses ten through to thirteen. And again, these are just some scriptures that refer to the end times, and it just helps us to keep our focus into the end, so that as God's church, as Jesus' bride, we are ready, prepared for the things that are to come. And when he does come back, we know we're going to meet with him. Uh, verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat, and both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now that's going to happen beyond the point that we are going to be looking at, but we know this is the end of the world. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, as God's people, our hearts and minds are not in this world, they're in the world to come. While we're in this world, we are part of it, and we are going to have to go through the things that this world is going to have to go through as God tests and tries everything so that he can find for himself a people who will be called the people of God. He will be their God. They will be his people, and they will live forever. I think it's very important, and in all my pre-thinking of everything, is just to make sure that our hearts and minds understand God is interested in saving people. And the whole, the whole work of history, really since the garden, is God has been looking for a people who will be his people. And we're coming into the end of the age now where the final testing of the earth will come to pass and everything will be tested so that only that which is of God will remain. And that's the journey that we're entering into. This whole testing process is intensifying, coming into this end of the age, and we are here. And we're here to be tested. And I would say as God's people, we should say, Father, test us, because we need to know if there's anything needs to be adjusted. But we all know that in the fire, then we are purified and we are made ready. And Jesus is building his church, which will be without spot or blemish, and he will proudly come and receive us on that great day. So we're not afraid of these times, but we understand the times. And we understand that God is testing everything. Jesus said if we're, our trust is in him, he will keep us during these days of testing, which will come upon the whole earth. So we have to understand that. And we will be tested because God is not leaving anything to doubt. Because when this period of time is over, then the heaven is for us, a new heaven, new earth, and we'll live to e for, for, forever with our God. And that's the end of that matter. There is no more sin. There is no more rebellion. There is no more hardened hearts, but just a people who love God, love being with God, and love enjoying his creation that he has prepared for his children. That's what God is looking for. And so there's going to be no doubt in his mind who is ready for that and prepared for that and we need to understand that that's the journey we are all in in fact the whole earth is in that same journey so last week we again just trying to create some background because here's the point that i believe we need to understand what is god saying and the problem is that the, the world is saying so much it's a very noisy world there's a lot going on and sometimes we can get our minds caught into the affairs of the world and we can get distracted into, well, this is wrong, that's not right, that, that shouldn't happen, or oh, that's okay. These are all worldly affairs. This is the world. What we need to know is what's God doing because we need to be entering into his will and purpose and understanding his will and purpose so that we can walk with him through this season. What is God doing? So I'm... 
I'm immediately telling you, God is purifying the earth. That's what he's doing. He's not concerned about nations. And forgive me if I say anything that you might seem a little bit offensive or something. But God is not concerned about the world. He's concerned about people. And the things that are happening in the world are the things that will happen in the world. And over and above it all, God is doing what he's doing to test the world and to test, what's he testing? Hearts. Where is the heart? That's the deal. And uh, you, you and I are here today because God tested our hearts and he found that, that they were good hearts, praise the Lord. And he chose us to be with him. Now, even in that, we will continue to be tested right through to the end. But we're here today. We'll be here tomorrow. And we trust we'll be here when Jesus comes back. Hallelujah. We will not fail in this testing time that the world is going through. So we looked at the fact that, that God had allowed these 6,000 years, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seventh is the time of rest where he and us will have our period of a thousand years in this world just to, to set the kingdom of God here. And in my understanding, as God always intended it to be, that he would be the God of the world, the Lord would be the Lord, and we would be his people and we would be loving him and his creation. So the kingdom of God will be established in the earth and we will enjoy the earth as God intended it to be right from the very beginning. He will take dominion and he will put all things under his feet. Hallelujah. <laughs> so devil, you're under the feet of God for a thousand years. And then after that, God has got another will for us and Sometimes people say when a new heaven and a new earth, some people talk in terms of a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. In other words, just a, a, a refreshed one of what we have. Now, I don't mind either way, because I think this is a beautiful world. If we take the devil out of it, I wouldn't mind living here. I love this place, you know, but, it, but it's for sure whatever God's got is better than what we've ever experienced so we can look forward to whatever is ahead but there is a thousand years here we saw that that's what god wants to do and there's this six thousand years of history from adam through to abraham through to jesus through to the end and we are now this the cross is in here we are 2,000 years in the BC, in the AD, and so we're coming up to the end of the 6,000th year. And you could say we're already past the 2,000th year. It's 2022. So we are right at this end of the age. That's why we're all perceiving and seeing and, 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 put, and, and, and understanding things are not as they should be. There's change coming, the end is coming, because it is coming. And there are so many things happening right at this point of the age where we live that we now need to be aware of. How is this age going to close? And how are we going to enter on into the age that God has prepared for us? And so last week we went through that and we also took a look in the book of Daniel. Because in the book of Daniel, Daniel speaks of this end of the age. And there are some issues that Daniel can enlighten us to about this end of the age, which we need to understand. And so we're going to go back into the book of Daniel just for a moment, just to recap some of those things. And then we are going to have a look at some of the things that I think need to happen before the 70th week uh, of Daniel comes into play and these are the things that should be leading up to the next phase of God's ministry into the earth and so let's go back to the book of Daniel I will remove this beautiful piece of picture <laughs> We 
because again I want us to believe what's going on because we have a, an intelligent understanding of it not just because somebody said I think it's the worst thing when God's people just believe what somebody said we need to discover the scriptures for ourselves and I encourage you to go and read and look at all these things just to settle in your own hearts and minds of the kind of things that are going to be happening through into this end of the age. So let's just go back into the book of Daniel because there is a fellow in there that we need to identify. We need to see that there's something going to happen and we need to be aware of the kind of things that are going to be happening politically, spiritually, and in every other way uh, in the world coming into this end of the age. So I just want to recap on that. And remember, we saw that the person that we're really looking out for is this fellow who, who we will be calling the Antichrist. He is the, he is the incarnation of Satan. This, just as Jesus is the incarnation of God, this Antichrist fellow is the incarnation of Satan. So he is the guy that will be taking charge of the world for a short season towards the end. And obviously, we are going to be an antithesis to him. So the Antichrist and Christ clearly will have a clash. But here's the good news. Christ wins. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we, we, we just need to be prepared for the clash that's going to happen before that, that victory is finally played out. But what I just wanted to do, because these are all political uh, systems that Daniel is talking to us about. And if we just go back into Daniel chapter 2, and I want to just do this quickly, we will see that Daniel speaks of a 10 kingdom empire which is to come you know the Nebuchadnezzar statue is there but there is a ten kingdom empire which is to be established if we read in verse 40 of Daniel chapter 2 and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron this is the legs inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all the others and whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and yet the strength of iron will be in it. So you've got Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue, and at the bottom of it, these beautiful toes are here. This is the kingdom. The, the iron kingdom is the Roman, uh, the uh, Greek, Medes and Persians, and the Babylonian kingdom, this kingdom, as far as we are aware, has not yet been established. It's a ten kingdom empire with a mixture of clay and iron. If we go to 42, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly fragile. 43. And as you saw, the mixture of ceramic clay will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not adhere to clay. Here's the good news for us. And in the last days, these king, the, the, these, of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom that shall not be left to other people, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. So, hallelujah. So I'm saying this to say there is something that we need to be looking out for, which is a ten kingdom empire or a, a ten nation kingdom of some form that is yet to be formed and it has uh, some weak parts and some strong parts and the strong parts will sort of hold it together. So that's just something that we need to look out for and I'm sure if we're ever aware of what's happening in the political scenes of the world, then we can see that this kind of thing will come into play fairly quickly as the global political system unfolds. So if we go to chapter 7, we can see another picture. 
Now these are all pictures of that conclude at the end of this age. So in Daniel chapter 7, we see again another vision. And uh, in verse 2, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came out of the sea and each one different from the other. The first one was like a lion and an eagle's wings and I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Now I'm not even intending for a moment to try to indicate to you what I think these things are because those things will become obvious as time goes on and I think we don't need to try to put these pictures into place they will become obvious as time goes on and we can speculate but it would be pure speculation so we have the lion and then in verse 5 suddenly another beast a second like a bear was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And uh, they said to it, Arise and devour much flesh. And so interesting that this bear had three uh, ribs in its mouth. Now later on, as we look in other ones, we see again there are, there is one horn that destroyed three horns. And it makes me wonder whether the, the three weaker kingdoms here, the three Weaker, or the, the weaker kingdoms here were the ceramic ones and maybe there was three of them because they didn't mix and ultimately the, old, the stronger one overtook that so we see this uh, ten becoming uh, seven three being consumed so all of these pictures are of the same end it's just that they're coming in different ways um, uh, verse 6, and I looked and there was another like a leopard. So we have a lion, we have a bear, and we have a leopard. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw night visions and hold a fourth beast. And listen to this fellow, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, had huge iron teeth, was devouring and breaking the pieces and trampling the residue with his feet. He was different from the other beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming out from among them before three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, of the eyes of a man speaking pompous words. Now, you'll see this pompous words, uh, arrogant, bl blasphemy, strong, evil, this, this fellow is the guy that's going to rise up into the earth and take the predominant position. Uh, verse 11, and I watched, and then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, and I watched till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed, and so on. So the rest of the beasts, they had dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So we'll see when we get to Revelation how all this unfolds. But again, this is the vision that Daniel's had. If we read over, uh, over the page into continuing in uh, Daniel 7, we see that Daniel asked, he said, tell me about this fourth beast. Um, and so, verse 19, I wish to know about this fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, teeth of iron, and so on and so on. Ten horns were on its head, and another horn which came in, and its eyes and mouth spoke pompous words, and appearance was greater than its fellows. And I was watching, which was 21, and the same horn was making war against the saints, prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came. Judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So we're seeing again the time of persecution, this guy will come against God's people but God will deliver us and we will reign and rule forever and so we can read on through this and this is for three and a half years, listen to uh, verse 25 and he shall speak pompous words against the most high we'll read those words again and again 
and he shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Listen to the next part. And then the saints will be given into his hand for time, times and a half a time. And so that's always the three and a half year period which we're going to begin to refer to here. So again, Daniel is talking to us about what's going to happen at the end. There is this fellow who's going to come into the picture. He will go against God's people for three and a half years. If we were to go to Revelation 11, I will show you that this picture is virtually exactly the same. And when we look at Revelation, we will see this picture unfolding again. In Revelation, well, if we go to 13 to start with, Revelation 13. Then I saw on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven head, heads and ten horns. And on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, had feet like a bear, and a, a mouth like a lion. Now the interesting thing about this is that this is one beast with exactly the same uh, parts, if you like, of the four beasts or, that came out of the sea in Daniel. And I conclude from that that whereas, whereas in Daniel he saw four or three different nations and then one more, in Revelation it's a, it's a conglomerate of nations that are coming as one nation against the people of God. And the other beast which rose up, uh, if we read down through here, and I saw one of the heads that had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed this beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave the beast. Now this beast is the Antichrist, and they worship the beast. But then we see in verse 11, we can read on down, but we will get to that later. I saw another beast coming out of the sea who had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And this is the false prophet. This is the, had horns like a lamb. We talk about a, um, a devil in lambs, wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> so this guy comes as smooth as you like, but it's the devil. And he exercises the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wounds was healed. So I'm just taking you from Daniel into Revelation to show you that these pictures are virtually the same. And Daniel is prophesying what's going to happen and we see it happening in Revelation and we're talking about an antichrist who will also have a false prophet working with him to deceive the people and try to cause them to worship the beast and ultimately to take the mark. But at the same time we're going to find there is a ministry of God's people telling them don't take that mark. Jesus is the Messiah. You need to follow him. So we're just getting a picture of what Daniel is talking about toward the end days. If we go to chapter 8, we see a similar picture again, but this time it's talking about a goat and a ram. But again, it's the little horn that comes through and it breaks in pieces the other horns. And if we just go to verse 9, and out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. That's God's people. And it grew up to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth to the ground and he did all this and prospered. So here's... Again, this Antichrist, God has released him to come into the world to, to, to oppose everything that's of God and against God's people. And again, the whole point of it is what? So people can make a choice. Now we've got 
God incarnate in Christ, now we've got Satan incarnate in this Antichrist, and the people have to make a choice. And so he will be doing his thing while God's people are ministering there. I just want to draw your attention to the last part of this, 13. And then I heard the Holy One speaking, and another Holy One said to a certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desola desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, 2,300 days. So I just want to note those 2,300 days over here. We've all, already had three and a half years. So these are some numbers that, that are significant for us. So we could read on down, but it's the same story, God wins hallelujah but there is a time where this fellow will come against god's people and set himself up as god in the sanctuary and so forth if we just go on reading we can see that this continued wars and conflicts around this middle eastern area and god always wins i want to just take you to uh, chapter 12 just for a moment because this speaks of the end time. So in chapter 12, then we're going to go back to 9, obviously, to look at Daniel's 70 weeks. But again, I'm just wanting you to catch that in Daniel, he's prophesying of an end. And that end includes the rising up of a fellow called the Antichrist, obviously a political figure. There will be all kinds of wranglings among the nations. There will be 10 down to seven there will be all kinds of, uh, of political conflicts going on and then out of it will come one person who will take a, 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 a leading position and this one will be the antichrist in chapter 12 at that time michael shall stand up and the great prince who stands watch over the sons of the people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people will be delivered and everyone who is found written in the book as many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt those who are wise shall be wise those in the brightness of his firmament and those who turn away to to righteousness like the stars forever and ever so god is going to conclude everything his people will rise and live forever the others will not but here's the interesting parts that i want us just to catch but you daniel shut up the words and sealed them until the time of the end Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, verse 5, looked, and there stood two others, one on this bank and one on the other bank. And one said to a man clothed in linen, who was above the waters, How long shall be the fulfillment of these wonders? And so he's asking, How long is this going to go on? Verse 7, And then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters, and he held out his right hand and his left hand and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. So this chaotic time is for time, times, and half a time. Now we're going to see that 1260 days and 42 months. All these numbers, are those are all the same period of time. But this is the same period again. Listen to this. There shall be time, times, and half a time, and then the power of the holy, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. And how can we interpret that? Well, we can only interpret it to say that when God's people, well, when those who are going to be God's people have completely given everything over to Him, where He is the only hope they have, then we can start gathering the people in. I remember talking about a woman in the, in the in the gospels who came to Jesus and began to worship him and I was asking myself how did she worship him 
And then I read, she said, Lord, I need you. And we really, you could say, we're not really going to be a part of God until we know we need him. And he is the only hope we have. And so you could say that God is going to test his people. And you, you, you may think this doesn't sound very nice. But, but listen, we have to look from God's perspective, not ours. God is taking the people on forever. He's not going to leave anything to doubt. And so we, everyone has to be tried and tested. And he's saying that when they've got to the end of themselves, when they are completely shattered, then, then the end will come. So it's a people who are going to get there to the very end. I love it when we read in Revelation, there's one or two passages which say, for, for God's people, just hang in there and be faithful, be patient, be faithful. In other words, the end is coming, but just hang in there. We have to go through this time. So we need to be prepared for that. And again, Daniel is bringing these prophecies. Then in verse 8, although I heard, I didn't understand. And then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9, and he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed uh, until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white. And, fin and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now listen to this little passage through here. And from the time of the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, shall, there shall be 1,290 days. 1,290 days. So that's not time times and half a time. That's not three and a half years. That's another 30 days beyond that and then 12 blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1335 days so in here we've got all these numbers are coming up but they are real numbers and God doesn't just give us numbers for no reason so somehow we have to try to work out how do those numbers fit into the pattern verse 13 but you go your way till the end, and you shall, for you shall rest and shall rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So this is the book of Daniel telling us about the end times. And we need to just catch this, all kinds of political wranglings. And that's exactly what's happening in the world today. And it will be all interwoven with economic systems because political system, the economic system, they're all interwoven together uh, to try to create a world that they think that they can sustain. But you and I both know that the Great Reset is really not about building a sustainable world, it's about building a world that's controlled by a few people. And so this kind of activities are going on now. All political systems trying to merge, trying to uh, create something, there'll be infighting, there'll be all kind of things going on, but out of it all will merge up some person, and we're going to see how that person is going to emerge when we now look at Daniel chapter 9. So let's just turn to Daniel chapter 9. This is why when we're watching the news, and you may or may not watch the news, it's up to you, some of it's not worth watching, I understand, but, but it's, it's interesting, and I think God's people should be interested in the things that are going on, because they're all things that, that should help us to put markers in the ground, because these things are going to happen. Remember we said last week, revelation will happen. In fact, it's already happened in God's eyes. And all we're doing is now outplaying the end as God had ordained it to be. And that's why nothing can change. It will happen. It must happen. Everything must happen according to God's will. And remember, the whole purpose is that God would have himself a people. And these people would be tested and tried 
and come through as pure gold. Hallelujah. In some ways, that may sound a little callous, etc. You know, we say, well, we're not really interested in what's happening in Ukraine. It doesn't matter what's happening in you. It doesn't matter anywhere. These are just wars and rumors of wars. This is the world we live in. God is testing people's hearts. And if we know, even in the Ukraine today, many people are coming to the Lord because the Christians are there ministering, which is exactly what they should be doing. And they're preaching the gospel and they're leading people to Christ. And this is perfect. So what's happening? The people are being tested. And it's complete foolishness in my mind that certain uh, certain uh, people groups within the world seem to think they'll be immune from any testing. God's going to test everybody because God has to know what's in the heart of people so that when he gathers us together, he knows we belong to him and he belongs to us. Praise the Lord. So let's now just go into Daniel chapter 9 and we're going to read from that typical uh, passage from 24 down through to 27. Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. So this is a picture, and it's interesting to note that this picture has nothing to do with the 6,000 years. This is, a, this is God speaking to Israel about what's going to happen within their uh, time frames. And so he's speaking about Israel, not the whole world. But we know it's happening right at the end of the age because we're right at the end of the age. So verse 24, Daniel again is asking about what kind of things are going to be happening toward the end of the age. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And so 70 weeks have been set out by God to complete what he needs to do in the earth and to set up his kingdom. 70 weeks have been set aside. Verse 25, Therefore no one understands it from the going, down, going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 69 weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So they're saying that from the rebuilding of the temple, which is at a certain time. There's a period of seven weeks and then 62 weeks, which is explaining that they're going to rebuild the temple and then the Messiah, if, if we read on into 26, and after the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. So, seven and, so at the 69th week, is when Jesus goes to the cross. Now, these are time periods that we have been given. The Messiah, the Prince, there should be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and the street will be built and the walls, even in troublous times, so the temple will be rebuilt. And then, after the 62 weeks, Jesus will go to the cross. Now, these are weeks of weeks so each of these is seven so that's 49 uh, weeks and this is 449 days what how much 400 and that's absolutely correct so those together make the full period why did they split it into two? Well, the, the um, uh, commentary says this is the period of the rebuilding of the temple, and then this is the period of Israel being tried and 
preparing for the Messiah coming here. This is 400 years plus 34 years, which incidentally, the 400 silent years until John the Baptist, and then the 34 years until Jesus went to the cross. So all that is interesting, but that's the way it is laid out for us here in Daniel. The thing to bear in mind is that obviously that is only 69 weeks, not 70 weeks. So what happens in here? And when does the 70th week begin? So let's read on. Verse 26, after 62 weeks, so that's the second period, then the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, obviously. And then the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall be with a flood. Until the end of war, desolations are determined. And so there's a period in here where Jerusalem is given over or to the Gentiles, and we typically call this the Gentile age. There is a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, which again we know is the 2,000 year period from Jesus to the end of the age. We call that the Gentile age or the church age. So there's a 2,000 year period in here between the 69 weeks and the beginning of the 70th week. So now we know that the 70th week begins really right at the end of the 2000 year period because we know that the only next thing to happen is the millennium age. And so this is how we analyze these scriptures. The Gentile age is in here, which is the church age, the age of grace where God is ministering into the whole world. In fact, some people say that the Gentile age began when Peter saw that cloth drop from heaven. Remember when and he said, don't call unclean what I call clean. And so that's the period of the gospel being opened up to the whole world. So that's that period in there, which is these 2,000 years in here. Then let's see what happens. Verse 27. So the people of the prince who is to come, he shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it will be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. So there's trouble. There's trouble in Israel or in the Middle East among the Jewish communities through this period. But this is the Gentile age. And we're going to look after our break at what is happening in this period before, well not this period actually, it's in the beginning of the 70th week. What is happening here to cause this next verse to come to pass? Then he shall confirm covenant with many for one week. So this prince who is to come, which of course is the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of the abominations shall be one who makes desolate. So he's going to make a covenant and we'll look at all that. But in the middle of the week, and the week is this 70th week, at the beginning of the week, he's going to make a covenant. In the middle of the week, he's going to break the covenant. And he is going to bring an end of sacrifice, which is the abomination of desolation, which we've talked about before. But what's going to happen to him? Even until the consummation, which is determined and is poured out upon the desolate. So he is going to have his little period in here, but God is going to completely destroy him. And we want to look at all that in more detail. So Daniel 9, 24 through 27, gives us a little picture of the... Jewish perspective of the end times. Rebuilding the temple, 434 years until Christ. Then there is a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. 
and the 70th week begins with what we're calling a peace treaty which in the middle of the week seven years he will break that treaty he will cause the abomination of desolation he will create havoc in the world but then God will come and finish the whole deal so we're going to take a short break and then we'll start putting this piece together and then we'll look at what's going to happen leading up to it praise the Lord <laughs> so let's move on what I want to do now is just to give you a little overlay of this 70th week again let's understand that God has ordained there are 70 weeks from the building rebuilding of the temple to the conclusion of the matter as far as the Israeli people or the Jewish people are concerned at the end of the 69th week there is a gap in the historical outworkings of that 70 weeks and this gap we are interpreting is the gap given to the ministry to the Gentiles and that gap is a 2,000 year gap from the time of Christ to the time of the end of the age so this is the age of grace and God is now at the end of that age he is ministering to his people through this period of time now we're still here at this period of time we are still ministering and being ministered to but primarily this 70th week is a week that the Lord has given to the Middle Eastern area to minister to his people now I say that in general terms because of course the whole world will be under testing the whole world will be under ministry but there will be a time where God is returning to his people to try to get them to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. So I just want to give you a little overlay of where I see this 70th week working, and then we want to go back and see why did we need a peace treaty in the first place, what is going on in Israel prior to this, and then we want to get into the revelation where we can start to overlay some of this, which is historical time, these are real times, this is real time. We don't know when this starts or when it ends, but we know there will be a treaty and that will put a marker in the ground for us. But this is real life happening. This is not our imagination. This is not some guy's fantasy story. This is a real period of time. And so what is going to happen is, as we're reading here, there will be a covenant. He will make a covenant. Now we know that that will be a peace treaty. Now to be a peace treaty there must be certain uh, things happening pre this and I am going to show you that there is going to be a lot of issues going on around the Middle Eastern area prior to this. Nonetheless a quite a big war which will go on and I will show that to you but there is a treaty which is being made if we turn to Daniel 8 we'll see uh, some of this fellow's um, ways Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 Daniel 8 this is the kind of character that this antichrist fellow has through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart and shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. So in the end, God is going to deal with him. So through cunning, this is the word I'm wanting you to catch. In Daniel chapter 11, and we're reading again, we'll see the same kind of uh, characteristic Daniel 11 and we're reading 21 through 24 Daniel 11 21 through 24 let me read to you and in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue 
and with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. 23, and after the league is made, that's the league, from my mind, is a treaty, is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. 24, and he shall enter peaceably even to the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers, and he will despise. Be, he, he will despise among them the plunder and spoil and riches and he shall devise his plans under against the strongholds but only for a time and so the point that I'm wanting you to catch is that this guy is deceitful, he's cunning and he comes peaceably smooth, I can, you can see this smooth exterior but an evil heart, a lamb with two horns but inside is, is this evil beast and so this is the Antichrist. This is the devil. And so he's making a treaty here, and that is for one week. Uh, I know Jeremiah chapter 6, just for your notes, we see another passage which is often referred to as a part of this passage. We don't know that for sure, but certainly what is written is similar. Verse 14 of Isaiah, of Jeremiah chapter 6. And they've also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, where there is no peace. And so, what I'm wanting to show you is that when this Antichrist comes, he will make a peace treaty with Israel, what we are saying. And he will be able to do something that his forefathers or their forefathers and fathers could not do. And I am suggesting to you that part of that peace treaty will be that there will be a deal among the Muslim people to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. As you know, since 1948, the Jews have not had a temple. And they're very keen to build a temple. For them, the temple is the place where they meet with God. That's, that's the sanctuary, the, the place where they... And they're very disturbed that they have not got a temple. And the Muslims, as you know, control the Temple Mount with the dome of the mosque and the al Mosque, Mosque, or whatever it's called. And they will not allow them to rebuild this temple. But we also know that when the Antichrist betrays, he will go into the temple and he will desecrate the offerings. So there must be a temple or some form of temple. It may not be the glorious Solomon's temple, but it will be a sanctuary of sorts in which the Jewish people have begun their, their temple offerings and sacrifices again. Now we know, and you can easily look it up, that as far as the Jews are concerned, they're building their third temple. It's all set to go. All they haven't got yet is permission to build it, but they are ready to go. And part of this deal, in my view, and I, I, I like the way it said, he, 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 he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. I, you kind of get the feeling that this guy is really cunning, and he was able to he was able to broker a deal which no one else could do. And believe me, they've been trying since 1948 to broker a deal to get this temple. So I'm thinking that part of this is going to be they're going to rebuild the temple uh, there. That'll be part of the deal. Okay. Now, we also know that there is seven years divided into two, three and a half year periods. Obviously, in the middle of the week we read, he will betray that covenant that he made and we know that part of that betrayal is that he will go into the temple he will desecrate the offerings he will stop the offerings and he will set himself up to be God and we can read that in 2 Thessalonians and we might as well just read through this because this becomes part of our end time 
because in my mind, this is the three and a half year period that there's going to be a lot of trouble. The Antichrist is ruling, the false prophet is ruling, and they're causing mayhem, and God is starting to really bring a lot of uh, tribulation into the world. This is a chaos period of time where the Lord is ministering, the Antichrist is ministering, and the whole of the world is just under enormous political, social, demonic pressure because God is squeezing everything to see what would come out. So if we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 3 2 Thessalonians speaking of this time well we can read from the beginning first chapter 2 now brethren concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him, which is what we're looking forward to, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it was from us, as though the day of the Lord had already come. Now, you and I know there's a lot of deception around all these things, and even in those days, they were bringing all kinds of deceptive ideas. Let no one deceive you by any means, verse 3, for that day will not come unless there is a great falling away first. Now Jesus talked about this. So during this period, we know there will be what is called the apostasy, which is people who are not really prepared or, 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 or were not overcome will fall away from the Lord. Jesus said, for the love of many will wax cold. It's the same idea. Many will fall away. But of course, many will also come to the Lord. There will be a great ingathering during this period as well. But this is the period of great trial in the earth in this period. So Jesus is, or Paul is speaking here, he said, the, the, the day of the Lord will not come. And the day of the Lord is when the Lord returns for his church. The bride comes forth. That the bridegroom comes for his bride unless there's a falling away first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition verse 4 who exalts himself above all that is called God that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself as God and so Jesus is not coming back until this guy is revealed there is a great falling away. He exalts himself as God in the temple. Listen to the rest of this we can read. Do you not remember that when I was with you that I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. What does that mean? That means that God, who is in charge of everything, is holding all things and gradually... God is removing his covering of the earth that is withholding evil. And as God removes these coverings, evil is manifest more and more into the earth. And we can see that. And reading on down, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy at the brightness of his coming. And so we could read all down. This is the work of the Antichrist and the false prophet as they try to minister into the world as God and deceive as many people as they can to follow after them. I thought it was interesting in Revelation under one of the seals, the pit of hell is opened. Now you imagine what's going to happen. In fact, you know, all hell will be let loose. Now, as I was pondering that, I'm saying when this covering is removed, then all hell will be let loose. It's the same moment. Because right now, God's got his foot on the lid, and he's only letting hell out, if you like, bit by bit, bringing the pressure into the world of evil. You imagine what this world's going to be like when that lid's taken off and the covering is taken away and this world can really see 
that's the idea from God, the world can see who this devil really is. At the moment, you could say, sort of slightly covered, as God is trying to ease people in to his kingdom and to believe in Christ. But they still won't. So, well, okay, we'll take this. <laughs> we'll open up all hell. Now, figure it out. You know. So, this is what's going on, and this Antichrist is coming in. So, we're verse 2 here. And then we're also seeing the same thing, of course, in Matthew chapter 24. And we will look at all these verses a little bit closer later. But Jesus talks about this. And this is an important scripture to catch because many people would say, well, how do you know that this hasn't already happened? Because there has been similar situations within the Jewish history where people have gone in and made an abomination of desolation and the temples have been destroyed and all these things and Jerusalem has been under the Gentiles and so forth. So how do we know this is yet to come? Well, we know it's yet to come because Jesus warned us it was to come. And Jesus is way up this end of the age. He's not back at this end of the age. Jesus said to look out for it. And in Matthew 24, we see that passage... verse 15, Matthew 24, I'm just reading verse 15, and Jesus said, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he who reads let him understand, let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of there. <laughs> so we are, we're understanding that this is happening at this end of the age. It's not happening here. Jesus warned us about it. Paul has brought reference to it, that Jesus won't come until this one is revealed. So we're understanding that that is to happen. In this period, we're going to see that there are going to be two witnesses who are witnessing to the Jews. Uh, and we, the Gentiles, will still obviously be ministering into the earth. I think it's important to notice that these things that are happening, this is happening in the Middle East, this is happening in Jerusalem. This is not happening in Tauranga, in New Zealand. So this is happening in Jerusalem. But the rest of the world is still there. And the rest of the world is still under, by now, a one government system. And the currency will be a digital currency, most likely. So the whole world will be under the influence of the Antichrist because it's a political system. But in Jerusalem itself, there is going to be some specific time of ministry for three and a half years. Some people say to me, well, you know, what, which three and a half is it talking about? Well, it's all talking about this three and a half. This is the time. This is the time that God is going to be, all things will come to a conclusion through this period of time. This Antichrist fellow, in my opinion, he comes as a peaceful fellow, but he is the Antichrist, don't forget. Mm -hmm. So he's manipulating things and he's cunning. And we're, we're going to see he's making peace in Israel. So for them, they're going to think that they've just come into a great time. The temple has been rebuilt. You know, it's all happy days until the middle of the week. And so while he is the Antichrist and the political systems of the world will be starting to squeeze the Christian world because digital currency and all these kinds of things, just like now, if we didn't know that when the governments get together they can't control us, we should know now. Mm -hmm. Governments can pass laws overnight and can completely change our world. And every government is in it, mm -hmm. not just one government. They're all in it together. Well, they'll be all in it together under this fellow. He'll be the one who emerges out of all the political systems of the world, and he will take that leadership. And because he creates this peace treaty here, he'll be the great hero of the world. We're also going to see that he miraculously recovers from, from a death. I'm not sure how he died, but he took a shot to the head, it seems, and he rose again. So he's taking a very dominant position through here. But his true colours are not really 
come to the fore until the middle because that's when he puts himself into the temple and says I am God you all need to worship me and so that is all going on in this period of time I just would say a lot of people talk about a seven year tribulation period now I don't see any seven year tribulation period I think the whole world's in tribulation and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse the, 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 the great tribulation period for me is this period in here this, when God talks about three and a half years, he's talking about that. So I'm utterly convinced this, this is the three and a half years that the world is going to be in absolute trauma. As God is dealing, the devil's dealing, and the whole world's in absolute chaos. We will see that as we open the seals and then the trumpets and the end time events, which God ordains. God is in charge. So, the period, this period here, again, is where Jesus returns and the church goes out. It is my conviction then that the wrath of God comes at the conclusion of this tribulation period because God has not appointed his people for wrath. And you have to understand what wrath is. Wrath is God dealing with sinners. Every person that has betrayed God, has no interest in God, is going to be destroyed in the wrath. I take you back to Noah's Ark. When God shut the door, right? That was the end. Only those that were saved went on to be with God. Everyone else, and a lot of people don't like to hear this or understand, everyone else was killed. So there is no salvation beyond this point. All salvation is available right to this point. Beyond here, there is no salvation. That's the finish. Wrath means wrath. It means God is coming to punish. And again, if we, we read Thessalonians, and we will at the end, when God comes with vengeance to, to avenge those who have, who have gleefully come against his people, and he says, I've had enough. That's us. We're done. Boom. That's the wrath of God. No one survives the wrath of God. And so God comes to destroy. So when I'm doing my numbers, and I'm just putting this as an idea, because I, I think it kind of works, but it might be completely wrong, and I repeat that, it might be completely <laughs> wrong. But remember we saw the 2,300 days, we've got 1,260 days, we've got 1,290 days, and we've got 1,335 days. So this is... 1260 days this is this is the three and a half years so if we were to go from this point and if we read that particular passage it's it's from the it's from the time of the sacrifices to the end this is the end this is when this the, the, everything is accounted for and God's people go out I'm wondering whether 2300 years is from the establishing of the new temple to the end. Now, if that's 